Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us. I'm Rebecca Bernhard, and I'm a partner in mostly our Minneapolis office and occasionally our Salt Lake City office. And I'm here this morning with my partner, Matt Dorham, and we're super grateful and a huge shout out to Jennifer and Shalom and Rima and Lori and everybody else on our crew um, who helped us pivot uh, in the midst of our snowmageddon. We're sorry that we didn't get to see you all in person, but we're super happy that our team was able to switch and turn this into a webinar. Uh, we've got a lot of great content and we're really happy to share it with you. Our title is Employment Trends to Watch in 2023, and um, there's a lot of them. Uh, but a few housekeeping items, uh, because this is now um, a webinar, you will be getting attendance forms. So so in order to get your credits, you'll need to send those in via email uh, and they'll all be emailed to you so that you'll know what to do. Um, the questions, we will take questions if you send them through the Dorsey U um, email address, which uh, Lori will send through the chat so that people can see that. And then Matt and I will review them after the presentation and we'll um, send out answers as soon as possible to those. Uh, we're going to give you the CLE code midway through, uh, and we'll say it a couple times, and then Lori will help us by putting it into the chat. Um, so uh, let me just give you a little roadmap of what we're going to do. Uh, Matt's going to start us off talking about employee restrictive covenants. There's a lot going on at the federal level, uh, and then that means necessarily that there'll be some stuff going on at the state level too. Uh, I'll then take over and talk about pay transparency, and again, patchwork of lots of uh, uh, state laws there. Matt will help us with remote work tips and traps, and then I'll finish us off with unlimited PTO and state mandates. So Matt, take it away. Thanks, Rebecca. And I really wanna thank Rebecca for um, making the trip out to Salt Lake to uh, be with us here today and apologize for the weather. Um, but I think that our Minnesotans are used to it. They, they can make it in the snow. Um, the issue of, empl of employees for restrictive covenants has been one that's seen a lot of evolution and change in the last few years. And so we wanted to cover that and give some um, um, ideas about things to watch for and kind of some best practices with respect to restrictive covenants. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of change in the last few years on the state level where states have started implementing more and more restrictions on how and when restrictive covenants can be used. And we've seen some trends like um, requiring employers to give notice to applicants or continuing employees that a non-compete agreement will be required and will take effect or limiting the um, substantive area that, a, that uh, the, the protected interest that a restrictive covenant can protect to trade secrets or confidential information or things like that. Um, we're starting to see states that are implementing salary thresholds where um, non-competes can't be used for um, other than high, more highly compensated employees and limiting the length of time that they can apply. Um, and so what we're re really seeing is kind of some increasing hostility mm -hmm. by the states to non-competes in general. And the thing that's complicated about that is it creates this patchwork situation where employers have a hard time coming up with a consistent non-compete policy and agreement that really works across their, their boundaries. It's really getting to the point where a one size fits all agreement isn't really possible much anymore. Utah joined this trend in 2016 when it passed its Utah Post-Employment Restrictions Act. Um, in, in the main, what it did is it limited the, the, the term of a non-restrictive uh, um, covenant really a non-compete to one year. And then it had certain certain exceptions for things like um, a non-compete agreement in connection with a quote unquote reasonable severance agreement. There hasn't been a lot of um, testing or, or, or court interpretation on that yet. Um, other exceptions include the sale of a business. Um, it specifically expresses that non-solicitation agreements and non-disclosure agreements are not covered by the act. So we're really talking only about non-compete agreements. And there are also certain industry specific prohibitions on restrictive covenants in Utah for attorneys, for um, broadcast industry employees. And in the legislature this year, there has been some consideration of um, expanding that to include, to include home health care employees. We're watching that bill to see, um, see what happens. But, but in Utah, 
any non-compete agreement longer than a year is void and, and employers in, in Utah need to be aware of that, of that restriction. Other states um, have joined in and are um, enacting restrictions of their own. And this is just an, an, a few examples of the restrictions that we've seen. For example, about a year ago, Illinois implemented um, some restrictions that they, you couldn't use non-compete agreements with employees who were paid less than $75,000 a year adjusted for inflation. So that number will go up out, o, over time. And there were certain notice and timing requirements where um, applicants and, and, and employees had to be given notice of the non-compete provisions and the timing of when, they, when it would take effect. About the same time, Oregon um, implemented something similar. Their salary threshold is higher. It's $100,533 um, and limited the term to one year. There is a garden leave option in Oregon where you can, if you agree to pay um, comp compensation of the statutory amount, um, or, or something greater, then you can um, get a non-compete agreement with, with a broader range of employees. Colorado wanted us all to know how serious they were, so they made violation of their non-compete statute a class two misdemeanor. Um, it would be interesting to see how that would be enforced at some point, but um, the, the point is Colorado is very um, actively um, limiting the, the, uh, the applicability of non-compete non agreements in its jurisdiction, as is Washington, D.C., which bans non-compete agreements except those necessary to protect confidential information or trade secrets. Um, we, we, I think, had become accustomed to thinking of non-competes as kind of a state law issue, and we were used to checking different states and seeing what their requirements are, and now we've started to see some developments on the federal level. Um, in July of last year, President Biden issued an executive order um, encouraging the FTC to curtail the use of non-compete agreements by administrative rule. And we'll talk about that a little bit in a little bit more detail in just a few minutes. Um, in addition, we saw a couple of bills introduced in Congress to um, limit the use of non-competes. The Freedom of the Freedom to Compete Act of 2021 um, basically would have amended the provisions of the Fair Labor Standards Act to ban non-competes for non-exempt workers and would apply retroactively. So employers would have to go back and um, rescind um, non-compete agreements for non-exempt employees. The Workforce Mobility Act of 2021 was also introduced and it would have restricted the use of non-competes um, to the use to the um, scenario where there's a sale of a business or a dissolution of a partnership and it would create a private right of action for aggrieved workers. So if an employer attempted to enforce a non-enforceable non-compete, um, the employee would have the right to um, sue the employer for violation of that act. I think um, a couple of things that are interesting to note about these two uh, bills is that they had some bipartisan support, which is noteworthy these days. Um, and the Workforce Mobility Act of 2021 has actually been reintroduced in, Cong in Congress this year. So we're following that and we'll watch to see what, um, what develops. I mentioned the um, President Biden's executive order to the uh, encouraging the FTC to adopt a rule, a rule. And in fact, on January 6th of this year, the FTC published a proposed rule that would um, ban non-competes um, in a very broad range of circumstances. Um, it was interesting to see that the FTC went out of its way to explain how it had authority to do that and what, what the uh, impact of non-competes on competition in the marketplace was. I think they're looking down the road and foreseeing the possibility of um, legal challenge to the rule, but generally the rule would be very broad and would prohibit non-compete agreements, um, including with independent contractors for any, really any employee except for um, um, in the sale of a business context. And it also would require a kind of a rescission of existing non-competes and actively informing workers that their non-compete agreements are no longer in effect. So as you can see, it's a very broad rule. It would have a really, um, significant impact on the economy and the way a lot of employers do business. The rule um, is 
under a 60 day comment period right now, that comment period expires on March 10th. And so employers and others can, can provide comments. We expect to see some pretty um, vociferous commentary from various trade groups and, and industries and businesses. And if, and my suspicion is that if the rule is adopted, it will be significantly pared back um, and may face legal challenges going forward. So we need to kind of watch this and see what happens. I would be surprised if we saw a rule as broad as the one that FTC has proposed coming out of the gates. So let's just talk for a few minutes about some of the best practices that an employer can use to um, implement non-compete um, agreements and policies in, in the current environment. First of all, I think it's really important to identify the state law where you're operating. Some states are pretty um, free with their, uh, their uh, restrictions on, on non-compete agreements. Other states allow um, non-compete agreements to be used more broadly. Some states will honor the law of, um, of another state if it's spelled out in, in a non-compete agreement. Other states won't. And so employers have to really be aware of what uh, states they're operating in and what the state law is in those states. I think it's really important to identify a protectable interest that you, that you as the employer are trying to take care of or you're trying to protect in this agreement. A lot of the backlash against non-compete agreements, I think, has come from some overreach. And if you remember the Jimmy John's case, Jimmy John's tried to have non-compete agreements with their sandwich makers, the people behind the bars making the sandwiches. And I think people kind of thought that was a little much that you couldn't really expect that someone working on the front line of a sandwich shop um, really had some protectable um, interest that an employer needed to, to fence in with a non-compete agreement. Along the same lines, I would try and match the restrictions in your agreement to the, the influence the employee has, whether that's a geographic area or a substantive area, a product line. Um, if, it's a, if it's an employee that has broad company-wide, nationwide influence, then you know that may, it makes sense to have a, a non-compete that that's broad, that, that is that broad. But if you're dealing with someone who's really assigned to one geographic area or one product line, I would try and limit their agreement just to make it appear more reasonable when you try and enforce it so that the courts will be more um, inclined to enforce. You need to make sure that you limit the scope of the agreement with respect to the time period, the geographic area, and the nature of the competitive business. And I think the more specific you can be about what that business is, um, the more likely a court is to enforce it. I would consider also um, whether you want to have some sort of notice provision in your um, policies and procedures for implementing non-competes. Many states don't require um, notice provisions, but if you kind of look down the road, what you need to be thinking about is how am I going to get this agreement, this agreement enforced? And you want to look like you've been very reasonable and fair. And I think if you can say, we told applicants they were going to have to sign an agreement like this. We told employees they were going to have to sign this agreement. This is, a, um, we, you know, we gave them this amount of time to consider it. It just makes you look like you're being more even-handed and more fair in implementing these agreements. You can consider garden leave, which is basically the idea of paying someone some or all of their salary during the time that they're um, restricted by their non-compete agreement. That's another way that the courts um, can say this, this, this has been an attempt to protect the company while not harming the employee and may enhance the likelihood of enforceability. Um, I think it's a good idea in your non-compete agreements to include acknowledgements that the um, the, of what you're protecting, whether there are trade secrets and confidential information, what the consideration really is for the agreement. Is it um, ongoing employment? Is it existing employment? Was there, was there some sort of bonus paid in connection with the non-compete agreement? Um, and then get the employee to acknowledge that the agreement is reasonable with respect to his or her ability to engage in their profession and, and, and be employed in the future. Um, I think you'd want to include a provision that would allow the court to reform the agreement if they find it overly broad, that they can scale it back and enforce it to the extent they find it enforceable. And it's helpful to have um, um, acknowledgements about a breach of the non-compete agreement constituting irreparable harm for the employer and that you've given the employee an opportunity to consult with counsel. Um, you might also include a provision that requires the employee to notify uh, 
future employers about their non-compete agreement so that the non so that the employer knows that they're hiring someone with potential restrictions on their abilities to work and a description of the remedies that the employer um, anticipates using um, including injunctive relief and damages um, is also helpful in just making the agreements enforceable so just remember you're trying you're trying to look down the road and make your agreement um, seem reasonable and enforceable to a judge and I think if you follow some of these best practices you'll be um, more likely to see enforceability and I'm going to turn the time now to Rebecca to talk about pay transparency Thank you, Matt. That was great. Um, I'm so happy that you're here to help me sort all that out because I feel like it's very, very complicated, all the different restrictions and all of that. Um, and I, what I'm going to talk about is kind of complicated too. Uh, pay transparency laws. Um, there are actually, these are premised on the idea that we need to do better in the pay equity world. Uh, and pay equity loosely is this concept that uh, women make less than men and of course, there is a federal law and many states have adopted a version of it, which is an equal pay act. And that's two people, a man and a woman doing the same job. It's still legal to pay the man more than the woman. But pay equity is a broader concept that says uh, comparable jobs. Uh, and so there are states that have um, some version of that. And what there is is a growing trend to basically um, uh, be more transparent with the idea that if people know what the job pays, if people know what other people make, then um, people will be able to advocate for themselves. And so I wanted to talk about three kind of general concepts under the pay equity umbrella, and I'm going to spend most of my time on the third one on this slide. Um, so the first one is wage disclosure protections. And these are generally um, rules, statutes, laws that say um, you cannot have a rule as an employer that prevents employees from talking to each other about their own salaries. Now, of course, if someone works in payroll or in HR or some other confidential uh, position, you can prohibit them from talking about everybody's salaries, but you can't prohibit, you know, Janie and Johnny from talking to each other about their salaries. And of course, the Federal National Labor Relations Act has long since seen that as a form of protected uh, concerted activity. So they've always um, uh, prohibited that. Uh, arguably, some EEOC regional offices have also seen that kind of uh, uh, um, uh, conversation as protected activity in so far as trying to make sure there's no discrimination going on. But there are also 23 states, including uh, the newest one to jump on board, Rhode Island, that have expressed statutes that say you cannot have a rule that prohibits people from talking about their salaries. And then there's salary history bans. And that was a wave that kind of started a few years ago. Um, according to our count, when we prepared this, uh, 28 states and D.C. and Puerto Rico have some version of salary history bans. And basically, um, uh, that's basically um, the employer is prohibited during the recruitment phase in asking somebody what they made. And the idea is that by basing your salary offer on what somebody else made at their prior or current employer, you may be perpetuating wage discrimination. Uh, the um, President Biden also jumped on this bandwagon in March of 2022 by issuing an executive order applicable to federal contractors. Uh, and um, New York um, has um, a nice robust one that basically prohibits employers from relying on applicants' wages or salary histories. Um, and you can't seek, request, or require an applicant or employee to provide their salary. And you can't refuse to interview an, or um, employ or promote or otherwise retaliate against an applicant or an employee if the employee is up for promotion um, based on their prior wage or their salary history. So if somebody volunteers their salary in the midst of an interview, that's okay, but you can't ask. And I know when these started popping up, many employees were like, well, what do we do? Um, and, you know, we advised, you know, don't ask for it. Ask, you can ask, what's your salary expectation? You can say, what would you like to earn? Um, but you can't say, what did you earn? And what do you earn? Uh, and so that's how you can get around that. And of course, um, we have um, uh, a quirky questions blog and we have some articles posted on that. So I direct your attention to that. Um, pay transparency laws really kind of jumped on the salary history bandwagon and said, not only can you not ask 
people for what they currently make or what they did make in their prior job, but you need to tell people what the range is. So as I said, I'm going to spend the rest of the, um, this section on those laws. So basically there are three categories. Um, there are, and this is um, another example of the patchwork problem that Matt talked about in the restricted covenant section. Each state, there's not a federal blanket that sort of applies to everybody. Each state has some combination of this. And I think in the growing remote work environment, as Matt's going to talk about next, um, this gets really complicated because how do you know which state laws to follow? But anyway, that's going to be Matt's job to tell you. Uh, uh, but right now we've got three major categories. There's the individual disclosures upon request or hire. So if somebody is interviewing and they ask you, so there's some states that say you have to provide it if the applicant asks. Um, there's those that require the employer to file annual disclosures um, with um, the state um, wage uh, an hour kind of agency that uh, enforces this rule, um, notably California, right? Um, and then there's those that require the employer to list pay ranges in their job postings. And some even go so far as to require, um, you know, pay ranges and benefits. And we'll talk about that in a second. So here is our general list of states that have, have or have recently passed what we call pay transparency laws. So um, as you can see, some just jumped on it. Um, New York's is going to be effective in September, um, but New York City uh, over on the right side there is local laws. So there are some local laws and then there are some state laws. And then the last bullet under Washington, um, we've got legislatures that are also uh, uh, considering these. And so, um, uh, we're tracking that and we're going to, um, uh, let you know what happens. We of course have a blog about that. Um, so I encourage you to go to quirky questions. Um, but I wanted to just note that, um, the newest States to jump on this bandwagon as of January 1st to 2023 were California, Rhode Island, and Washington. And then as I noted, New York's goes into effect in September. Um, uh, and the, the, the difficulty that we have with this, um, in advising you all is that there are variations, um, among the laws. Um, so, uh, for example, Colorado might require both a um, comprehensive pay range and a list of applicable benefits, while New York might simply just require the pay range. Um, it's also very unclear what the applicability to remote workers is. Um, now, of course, some states are taking the position that they are applicable to remote workers uh, outside of the state. Um, and uh, I think that's probably a jurisdictional issue that will get litigated pretty quickly. Um, but that doesn't stop the agency from trying. Right. Uh, and then there's the problem of like, well, we don't know whether somebody in Colorado is going to apply to this job. We're in Utah. We posted it. We said remote works. OK. We don't really know where the person is. So why do we have to comply with Colorado's law? Because somebody saw it. And those are really tricky. And then, of course, there's always the problem of these are all hasty and they're really addressing a political problem and as much as addressing an economic problem. And so they're often drafted quickly and they're very unclear uh, and it's hard to know um, what to do. For example, New York's, which goes into effect in September, just recently uh, modified it before it went to effect to clarify that you have to have a supervisor in New York even, and you have to be remote in New York and report into somebody in New York for it to uh, apply. So that was nice. Um, so again, we're trying to keep on track of this and, and uh, we're trying to keep everybody updated. Uh, but as, um, as we know, uh, the law keeps changing and people keep um, modifying it as the workplace itself changes. So what do we think you should do? Well, first of all, you need to educate uh, your management team and your HR folks. Um, uh, I talked about the salary history ban and I think a lot of people still don't know that. And I think a lot of managers who do maybe that first what I'll call soft recruiting when they meet someone at a conference or uh, maybe through LinkedIn uh, and they're like, oh, wow, I really like this person. And maybe I'll start sort of wooing them before I put them in the official recruitment uh, uh, chain. And they might not know about these laws. And so they might actually say, what do you make now? Uh, and, you know, I can't tell you what the position is going to make. And they might sort of inadvertently not understand that they're subject to compliance. So you want to make sure that anybody who might be touching recruitment is aware that there are these new rules that you need to, to follow.
We are recommending um, for employers who, um, especially employers who have a national scope and a and a somewhat uh, uh, active remote or hybrid workforce, that you conduct um, a comprehensive pay equity study um, so that you can help remedy um, uh, and I- identify, and if necessary, remedy uh, any pay uh, discrepancies that you have. We think it should be completed under the attorney-client privilege because that way, obviously, data is never privileged, but the analysis and what uh, decisions you make as to how and if you remedy situations um, uh, would be privileged. Uh, and you want to have leadership buy-in if you're going to take this step because um, you don't want to identify a concern only to sort of have um, senior leadership say, we don't want to address that right now because then you do have uh, discoverable evidence potentially uh, in which you've notif- noticed a problem and you aren't going to take care of it. Uh, depending on the size and the footprint of your employees, you might want to consider uh, sort of a uniform policy. Um, that might not be practical and it might not be desirable for everybody, but some of the larger corporations, uh, notably Microsoft and IBM, are jumping on that uh, uh, bandwagon and saying, you know, this patchwork is really difficult and we're just going to go ahead and find uh, the most uh, employee friendly of these uh, transparency requirements and we're going to make sure all of our posted jobs comply with it. Uh, That way, if somebody happens to be uh, considering a position, we know that we've complied with that that particular state's um, uh, laws. Um, Of course, the the variations among the state laws are not always easy. Uh, Is a link to the benefits policy sufficient under Califrater's law, uh, or must you actually list out uh, the details of it? Uh, If you provide a pay range uh, and somebody asks for it under a state where you can, you have to provide that information if someone requests it, have you already complied by having the pay range in the posted ad in the first place, uh, or do you need to re-inform them of it? Uh, And those are um, issues that we're going to have to sort out Uh, Nobody wants to be the first one to get charged with a a violation under an agency, Um, but we're uh, we're waiting at least for additional guidance from these agencies to see uh, if they're going to modify some of the practical implications and implementation guidance, um, like like thankfully New York did uh, earlier this month. Uh, and again, I want to commend you to our quirky questions block. I don't know how many times I have to say that, so I'll stop saying it. Um, uh, but we uh, do try to keep up on that. And there are some good articles in there about the current ones um, in existence and, and some other practical tips to comply. And with that, I will let Matt tell us what we do with all of our remote workers. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, If there's one thing that has sort of defined the changing workplace in the last few years, I think it's the advent and the expansion of remote work. Um, It was something that was kind of on the radar screen pre-pandemic, but with the pandemic and um, what that required of um, employers and employees, we really saw that explode. And now it's it's something that um, most employers are, are dealing with. So we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the issues to be aware of, some of the traps to avoid, and things that you can do to um, um, implement remote work policies in your work, workplace in a way that complies with the law. We kind of need to talk about what it means to be a remote worker or or, um, for purposes of this presentation. So what we're talking about here is an employee who works in a state where the employer does not have its corporate headquarters, doesn't have facilities, operations, or connections, and probably has a limited, maybe just one, a limited number, or maybe just one employee in the state. So So this is somebody who is working in a state that's really not connected with the the employer. We're not talking about employees working in the same state of where the company's located, working from home. That has considerations for sure and things to think about, but it's not really what we're talking about in this presentation. We're not talking about expatriate employees in other countries or independent contractors as a class. We're really talking about employees who are working in a state remote from where the the company where they're employed by does, does business. There have always been questions about whether a state law a state's law will compl- will apply to an employee performing law um, performing services in a certain state, and um, courts and agencies have looked at factors like these to determine whether a state's laws should apply. What's the purpose of the employee being in the state? Are they there to 
work for the employer, perform, actually perform services, deliver goods, deliver services, or are they there to attend a conference or a training or something like that? How long are they going to be in, in the jurisdiction? Are they there for a one-day meeting or presentation, or will they be there for a longer period of time? How often are they in the jurisdiction? Is this a one-off situation, or is this something that um, is really a regular part of their job? And then what is the type of job that we're talking about here? If it's an actor or a salesperson or a professional athlete, maybe their tra the transient nature of the services they provide means that the state laws shouldn't really apply. But if it's someone who has a more traditional job, um, perhaps the state that state's law will apply. As you look at these four factors, you can see that the remote worker that we're kind of talking about will often um, satisfy all, some or all of these factors. They're usually someone who's working on a regular basis, performing services for the company. They're in the location because that's where they want to be working. And so the, the, they often trigger um, considerations about what the state where they're working applies. So we want to talk about a few different areas of the law that you should be um, aware of and think about as you're um, managing and, and, and hiring remote workers. And the first one I wanted to talk about was wage and hour issues. Um, again, a big patchwork of different re uh, requirements and, and regulations around the country, depending on the state that you're operating in. And that would involve things like who's exempt from overtime, who's exempt from uh, wage laws, what the minimum wage is, how overtime works, how break time works, all those kinds of things. Um, you just need to be aware that different states have different requirements about that, and you may need to apply that, that law to your, your remote workers in those states. Um, there, states also have different tests for whether an employee is properly classified as an independent contractor, and agencies within those states may have their own tests for how you determine who an independent contractor is. We don't really have time to get into that and, and, and talk about how um, you make sure you're classifying properly, but we just wanted to raise that as an issue for you to think of and be aware of as you um, implement remote work policies. Um, Rebecca just talked about paid transparency and disclosure and mentioned that, of course, that's an area of the law where we really need to be aware with respect to our, our, our remote workers. Um, and then different states have different considerations about things like payout of vacation or PTO upon termination. Some states require that accrued PTO be paid out. Other states have it governed by company policy or handbook, but you just need to be sure that you're complying with the law um, if it applies to your remote workers. And then of course, there are also laws about um, termination pay, um, when that last paycheck has to be paid in Utah, if it's an involuntary termination. They have to get their final paycheck within 24 hours. If it's a um, voluntary termination, they have to get it by the next payday. But different states have different requirements about that, and it's an issue that um, your HR folks should be aware of. Another area to think about is um, mandatory policies or training with respect to discrimination and harassment, especially sexual harassment. And there are some states you can see here on this slide that have enacted requirements with respect to sexual um, harassment policies and training in their states. And this might be things like requiring what the, you know, specific things about the content of the sexual harassment policy um, or what kind of training is delivered and, and how frequently. Um, there are different states have different requirements about um, how many employ which employers will be covered by these requirements based on the number of employees they have or the number of hours that an employee works. Again, we can't really delve into all the details about every requirement in every state, but just to help you spot the issues of things to be aware of, this is another area where employers need to think about laws that might apply to a, re a remote worker. Um, unemployment insurance is another one of the issues to spot. Um, you should check the coverage requirements in each state where you're operating, and that might include where you have remote workers. Um, the requirements can be different. Some states like Georgia, for example, and I think I would put Utah really in this category, if the employer is, um, if the employee is performing services in the state, they're gonna be covered by unemployment insurance in that state. Other Others, um, states may have requirements where you have to reach certain thresholds with respect to pay or amount of time or something like that but it's just an, an, an issue that you should be aware of. Employees can file for employment, unemployment benefits in, in any state, 
and um, they'll be governed by the state where they worked and the state agency will figure out whether they think that they're entitled to that, um, that coverage. One thing to be aware of is you can enter into an interstate reciprocal coverage agreement, which allows um, employers in multiple states to kind of centralize their payment in one jurisdiction. And it's just a way of making sure that um, you've thought through how you're gonna get your unemployment um, re reporting requirements done, where you're gonna pay and how, how the, who's gonna pay out, pay, out, pay out the benefits. And it's an issue of registering with, with the state agencies involved so that you can, um, um, be covered appropriately as um, according to how you want to structure things. Workers' compensation is another area to think about. Um, different states have different um, requirements about what employers are, co are uh, covered. Um, many states say if you employ one employee, you need to have workers' compensation employment for that, workers' compensation insurance for, the, for that employee. Others have some other thresholds. And states have different exceptions of uh, classes of employees that are not covered by um, workers' compensation insurance. An interesting one I ran across the other day in Alaska, professional hockey players and coaches are exempted from workers' compensation if they are covered, otherwise covered by health insurance. So states have different, different exceptions and you can just, you need to sort of be aware of what the law is in those states. They might also have different um, definitions of what a compensable injury is. For example, emotional distress injuries um, or occupational disease injuries may be treated differently in various states. Some states have reporting requirements where you have to report not only um, to, uh, you have to not only keep a, a record of injuries, but you need to make a report to a state agency about workplace injuries. Um, some states allow self-insurance and others require that you obtain your insurance through a um, assigned insurance pool. Um, and the defenses that an employer has about things like going and coming to, to work or what's being done in the course of employment uh, might be different from state to state. And you can see how these issues are really um, complicated in the area of remote work where you have someone who suddenly their workspace might be their living room or their bedroom. And um, what does it mean to be going or coming to work in that context? Or when are they on work? When are they off work? If they're walking their dog on their lunch break and they fall, are, is that a workplace injury or not? And it's mostly gonna be an issue of just being aware of what the law is in the jurisdiction where that employee works. Again, kind of like unemployment insurance, there are opportunities to enter into reciprocity agreements with various states so that um, if you're operating in more than one state, you can coordinate your workers' compensation benefits. Another area to be aware of is uh, laws re regarding um, expense reimbursements for employees. Some states are quite aggressive and require that the employee re reimburse employees for all necessary expenses um, incurred in connection with their performance of duties. And I would put California um, and, and maybe the Dakotas in that category. The, the, Dakota, the Dakotas talk about um, expenses that are um, necessarily um, incurred in direct consequence of the discharge of their duties. And I think that presents an interesting question with respect to remote workers, because um, if they are required to have computer equipment or internet service or a certain type of hardware for their computer or something like that, um, is that a covered expense? Or if they're choosing to work remotely, is that like an expense that's necessarily incurred? Those are things to kind of think about, but it's going to be, a, it may be a different answer in different jurisdictions, depending on where, where, your, where your employee is working. Another really, um, complicated area to, for remote work purposes is um, the leave laws in various states. Most states have provide um, leave for things like voting or jury duty, maybe domestic violence or things like that. But other states have um, organ or blood donation leave. They provide leave for certain holidays, um, maybe different types of uh, family leave. Um, and so that's another area where employers who have remote workers need to be thinking through what the leave requirements are in the jurisdictions where they're hiring employees. In Minnesota, with respect to pregnancy disability leave, for example, an individual 
there's a, a requirement that an individual be employed for at least a year and certain other criteria before they're entitled to pregnancy leave. But in Utah, pregnancy leave is just considered an accommodation under the anti Utah Anti-Discrimination Act. And so really any employee working for an employer covered by the act, it would be entitled to some sort of pregnancy leave. Some states have their own kind of version of the Family and Medical Leave Act. Um, that might differ or be more broad or more protective than the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act and others, other states don't. And so you need to be aware of what the family and medical leave situation is. And then area, um, the area of earned sick time is also one that can be really um, a complicated one, not only because you're facing the patchwork from state to state, but you're also starting to see differences in municipalities, local ordinances about um, sick leave. For example, Minneapolis, requires employees with six, six or more employees to provide sick leave and, sa and safe time. Um, and so you need to check, you know, the state where you're operating, the city where you're operating and make sure that you're complying with um, leave laws, especially with respect to earned sick time. Then there's kind of another, just kind of laundry, laundry list of things employers need to think about. For example, um, some states have, um, laws that prohibit in inquiries during the hiring process with respect to criminal history, um, or as Rebecca mentioned, pay, um, pay history or um, uh, pay questions. Um, marijuana legalization in some states has complicated the application of drug, drug testing policies. And that's maybe something to think about as you bring on em employees who may work in states where the regulation of marijuana differs from other states. Um, and then there are um, some variations from state to state in what the protected classes are under their discrimination um, discrimination laws. For example, some states protect familial status or off-duty conduct, um, uh, legal drug use, things like that. So where you may be accustomed to looking at one very familiar set of protected classes. If you're operating in other states, you may need to just think about whether there are um, other classes that of employees where you need to be careful about um, discrimination issues. Um, payroll and employment taxes are uh, another issue where employers with remote workers have to be aware. Um, Tax, um, taxing and reporting and withholding requirements vary from state to state. And that's one issue where you probably should consult with um, your council or, or um, payroll company just to be sure that you're complying with those, those state laws in those states. But then in, in addition to that, some states have, and, and even localities have um, specific employment related taxes that are unique to their, to their jurisdiction and that you need to be aware of, for example, in Washington, there's the Washington Cares Fund that requires um, uh, payroll deductions. And in California, they have a payroll deduction for paid family leave. So what is an employer to do with this complicated set of issues to think about and, and, and areas that they need to address with respect to hiring their, work, their remote workers? I think you should think about where do we want to do work? Do we want to just open up to remote work anywhere? Do, are there certain states where we want to work? Are there certain states where we don't want to work? And it's an interesting um, question. Some of that is going to be based on the operations and the industry of the, that the, of the employer. Um, and some is going to be on the environment of the workplace where, the, where you're hiring the employee. Some employers might want to find a workplace that is very employer friendly because it, um, lessens the administrative burden in complying with all the laws that, that might exist in a more employee-friendly state. But other companies may want a more employee-friendly environment for recruiting purposes. They may have a workforce that wants a, a more progressive um, environment in which to work. And so you can sort of think about what kind of state you want to operate in and maybe make some intentional choices about whether you're going to um, allow remote work in certain states or not other states, or if you're going to um, target states for um, recruiting or not. Um, there are certain states that um, have sort of gained a reputation for being particularly employee friendly and a little bit difficult for employers. And those would be states like California, Colorado, New York, maybe Massachusetts. Other states um, are known for being a little bit more employee friendly. And so that's just something that um, employers can think about 
we put together this very handy map um, that rate kind of rates by um, um, difficulty in hiring requirements and 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 um, employee law burdens. The darker the state, the more difficult it is, or the more regulated the workplace environment is, and the lighter, the the less the less regulated. So this um, is an imperfect tool, but might be a little bit helpful in just sort of thinking about which states um, are going to be more complicated for remote workers and which states less complicated. Um, and as you as you look at the map, you can just remember the kind of the list of issues to spot and think about as you're doing as you're um, hiring or recruiting remote workers. And with that, I'm going to turn the time back to Rebecca to talk about unlimited PTO. Thank you, Matt. I'm going to go back to the map for one more moment because I just love it. Um, and it's kind of a nice uh, lead into my my issues too, because although my issues are sort of off, off of the uh, legal um, landscape, because there's no requirement to um, give unlimited PTO, it's really a trend that I'll talk about. But there are, as we've already touched upon, a lot of local leave laws and state leave laws and mandated time off, whether it's paid or not. And so when you think about this map, um, you know, it's likely that the darker states like California and Colorado, and maybe even my home state of Minnesota, which is like the second darkest, um, might have laws that make it a little harder for the employer to know what to do versus um, you know, we all we all love employees in Utah uh, and Arizona because it's one of the less regulated states. And so it's good to do business in uh, places like that. Um, so uh, and so shout out to everybody who helped Matt and I with this map. <laughs> um, so uh, there is a growing trend. Um, uh, and I admit that I wasn't aware of it until one of my clients mentioned it. Um, but then I started to learn about it. And um, there's this concept called unlimited paid time off. And, you know, a cynical employment lawyer like me, who's always seeing ghosts around every corner is like, what, how do you make sure people actually come to work? Um, and, uh, it turns out that people do, uh, it turns out that there are pitfalls in unlimited PTO. And so we're going to talk, we're going to spend the rest of the time together talking about the pros and cons of, uh, unlimited paid time off policies. Um, but I did a little bit of survey work um, uh, for today, and turns out that the number of employers who reported, and so this is self-reporting, uh, and this was a time-tastic uh, 2022 survey, uh, they rose 178% between 2015 and 2019, which um, really uh, shocked me. Um, uh, and then there's mixed results, though, on the employee satisfaction. Um, uh, some survey Surveys suggest that um, 30 to 42 percent of respondents work while they're on vacation. They feel like the unlimited PTO really means no PTO. Um, uh, and um, uh, other folks say that they actually want an unlimited PTO as a benefit over some other traditional perks like a higher salary or some other uh, 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 employee benefits that uh, traditionally uh, we use to uh, entice workers to come uh, work for us. Uh, I think some of the comments in the folks who felt like they um, didn't uh, get real time off uh, tended to be from higher level uh, uh, exempt managers and executives uh, who were like, well, yeah, I have an unlimited PTO, but I never really get any time off. Um, uh, and, and so that's a sort of um, interesting sort of lead into what I would uh, say is kind of my compiled list of the pros of unlimited PTO. Um, it can be a recruiting and retention perk. It's particularly trending high in sort of the um, tech industry and in startups in general. Um, and I think that's because of the second bullet point I list, which is you can eliminate administrative PTO tracking tasks. And if you're an emerging company, um, uh, and uh, especially if you have uh, mostly exempt workers working for you, this idea that you have to do sort of daily and hourly tracking uh, can seem like a big burden. Uh, and if you're lean in terms of your overhead, um, uh, then getting rid of this burden uh, of administrative tracking uh, is very desirable. Um, for those states that require um, uh, payout at the end of um, employment, you've eliminated that. I've jumped down to the second to the last bullet. Um, but then going back up to the third bullet, um, some uh, companies um, and some states uh, uh, employers have uh, practices where people um, maybe 
lose, you have a use it or lose it. That's not okay in certain states, but in states where it is okay, there's a, a generally a year end rush, right? And that may be an actual year end, i.e., December, but it could be whatever the kind of fiscal year is for the employer's uh, vacation accrual period. And so the idea is, uh, you know, oh my gosh, if I don't take my two weeks before December 31st, I'm going to lose. Uh, my two weeks of time. And so suddenly everybody's taking time off in December and you can't get any work done because they're all rushing. Uh, so having this sort of unlimited uh, uh, benefit avoids that year end rush. Um, and then again, um, uh, there is a financial accrual of PTO uh, on the books. So separate from whether you have to pay it out or not at termination, while the employee is still employed, it is an earned benefit that they're entitled to depending on what your policies are. And so you have to carry that balance on your books. And so some startups who are interested in acquiring investment capital find that that can be a liability, especially in a startup environment where a lot of sort of uh, early workers are working all the time anyway and are never taking their time off. And so they have two and three and four and suddenly, you know, months accrued over the course of, you know, the first three or four years of the business. And so an investor looks at that and says, whoa, you've got a pretty big uh, burden there on your on your PTO. And that's a, that's a, um, a problem for us when we look at your financials. Um, and the number one benefit, which I think we all experienced uh, as we got more sensitive to contagious uh, uh, illnesses, um, is that unlimited PTO does um, reduce the chances that an employee will come to work when they're sick. Uh, folks who have limited amounts of sick or vacation, if it's segregated or PTO, tend to save it up for their trip. Uh, tend to save it up for, uh, you know, a leave that they know is coming up um, maybe for another medical reason or whatever. And so that occasional day of the flu, uh, they're going to come to the office and now suddenly everybody um, uh, is sick. Okay. So is unlimited PTO really unlimited? So these are some of the risks uh, to having this policy. Um, an employee's expectation of what counts as unlimited, an employer's expectation of what counts as unlimited can be very different. Um, and so um, we recommend, and I'll get into the recommendations um, in another slide or two, but uh, it's important that everybody's on the same page because um, I'm sure that most employers who give unlimited PTO don't expect people to never work for the full year. Um, and hopefully employees don't think that either, but you know, there can be very different expectations in that regard. Um, and so it's uh, natural for an employer to want to set sort of guidelines around the PTO. And we recommend that you do set guidelines, but if you start to set the guidelines in a way that, um, uh, are too restrictive, uh, and I'll explain that in a minute, um, you may not avoid the tracking or the payout obligations. If you say we have unlimited PTO, but we don't expect people to take more than six weeks off in a year, it is possible that some states that have a requirement that you pay out accrued vacation will say, well, you really give six weeks of time every year um, because you've set that kind of expectation that specifically. Um, and, you know, it is subject to employee abuse. Um, not every workplace culture can sustain some uh, uh, self-management uh, with regard to time off. And so how do you terminate someone for being absent if they have unlimited PTO? Uh, they're not really violating a policy if they have unlimited time off that's paid. And you actually still may need to tack time off, um, uh, especially with non-exempt employees. Um, and you also have to show compliance um, with certain um, mandates that require paid leave. Uh, Matt mentioned um, some of the sort of sick and safe leave ordinances. Now, some of the, some of the mandates are unpaid, like um, time off to vote could be paid or unpaid depending on the state. Um, but some of uh, the states have uh, paid uh, time off um, uh, sick leave or paid time off uh, some component of family leave. And if you're giving unlimited PTO, how do you show that you have complied with those um, uh, policies or those um, state mandates? Um, so here are some examples of those uh, paid time off mandates that you as an employer are required to be able to show if the agency that enforces these ever comes and conducts an audit. Um, so first and foremost, federal contractors, if you contract with the federal government, uh, and I want to say it's like, I think this was enacted in some time in the late Obama years, um, uh, the federal contractors have to provide sick time 
um, uh, and um, even and you can comply if you have a PTO policy, but it has to be that specific amount of time, and you have to allow them to use it a certain way, and you have to actually show them that amount on their paycheck. Uh, California has a lot of local sick leave laws, and during the early stages of the pandemic, they passed a lot of COVID-related paid sick time laws. Uh, Illinois, especially Chicago, has a sick and safe leave. I think Matt mentioned this already, but uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul each have their own sick and safe uh, time leave. They're mostly the same, but they're slightly different enough to keep people like me employed. Um, uh, New York City also has a sick and safe leave. Um, Oregon just jumped on the bandwagon for state paid leave, and Portland has a paid leave law. Uh, and Seattle has a paid sick and safe time uh, law. So um, if we go back to the map, they're shaded a little darker uh, than some of the other states for these very reasons. And most of these require you to show that you are in compliance if an employee files a complaint with the agency and says, I didn't get my paid time off. So uh, first and foremost, uh, we believe that you should consider offering unlimited PTO only to exempt employees or higher level managers. Um, uh, it is too risky, in my opinion, to offer unlimited PTO to non-exempt employees because those are folks who should be tracking their time in some format anyway and must be paid for every hour that they work and must be paid overtime for every hour over 40 in a work week under the federal law, over eight in a day under California's law, and some other states have different requirements um, for longer days as well. So it is very complicated to administer an unlimited PTO where you're not tracking with employees who are tracking their time off anyway. So if uh, you take nothing from this section, please consider only offering unlimited PTO to exempt employees. And I have clients who only offer to kind of directors and up. Um, and they're probably the ones who are reporting on a survey. I never could take time off anyway. <laughs> um, uh, you want to draft your policies to exclude the applicability of the unlimited PTO benefit to other mandated unpaid leaves, like the biggest one would be FMLA. So I get my 12 weeks of FMLA because I had a medical issue and I come back and I immediately take two months off to escape this snowmageddon and decide to go sit in Florida for two months. And you're thinking, Rebecca was just off for 12 weeks on a medical leave. And now she's off for two months. And I'm like, yeah, because I have unlimited PTO and you know, what's the diff? Um, so um, you also might want to think about like requiring supervisor approval for time off, like in a consecutive manner. So while you have unlimited PTO, if you're going to take more than two consecutive weeks off at a time, you need to give six months advance notice. But if you're gonna take two weeks off or less, you need to give one month's week notice, one month notice, that kind of thing. So rather than say you only get six weeks off, which again, looks like you really only have six weeks of PTO, put limits on how much time you can take off in any consecutive block and require manager approval for that block. And that way you can help minimize uh, abuse. I think it's also important um, to uh, make sure that uh, managers and supervisors are trained in performance management. So it's very easy um, when you don't have unlimited PTO and you have a specific attendance policy to really manage poor performers on an attendance basis, right? And that's a very objective um, uh, uh, hard to argue from a discrimination perspective, uh, type of, uh, misconduct, right? We have a attendance policy, you violated it. Um, it's very clear, um, an unlimited policy. It's harder to say you violated it. Um, but you might want to then focus on performance management. Uh, are people missing deadlines? Uh, is the work sloppy or incomplete? Uh, and if you focus on that, with your exempt workers rather than their attendance, it'll be easy to curb abuse of an unlimited uh, PTO policy. So questions, we're at the end of our time and questions should be submitted to Dorsey U. And um, I believe Lori has posted that in the uh, chat box. So we're really excited that you were able to still join us uh, online. We're really um, sorry about the weather. I thought that we could do anything about it. Um, uh, and uh, we'll um, uh, see you all in person when the sun shines. Uh, thank you very much.